Welcome to Queerly Thinking. I'm Reese Wheatley. Today I have special guest Samuel Stone, a junior studio art major with the goal of becoming a paleontologist, and they are also an avid gamer. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I am fantastic. I've been so excited all week to have you on the podcast. Honestly, I've been thinking about it. It's, 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 I was really looking forward to it. <laughs> good, good. So you identify as non-binary and go by they, them pronouns. I do. Being someone myself who identified as non-binary before this for about a year before I came out as trans, my understanding is that non-binary is an identity under the trans umbrella. And it essentially means that you don't fit into the societal gender binary of male or female. What are your thoughts on gender identity being a spectrum? Uh, well, I think it's that is how it is for me. Uh, non-binary is under the trans umbrella. Um, for me, yeah, basically, I just don't identify either as a male or female. Um, and I think it's definitely gender is an umbrella thing. Like, it's not just as complex as male or female. I think there are multiple different, I mean, what we know, there are multiple different spectrums and identities and all of that. And I'm just, I identify in a very small fraction of it. Understandable. So would you say, because you're more masculine presenting, but you also, just knowing you for a while, you also tend to embrace your feminine side, which is difficult for specifically men to understand because I think that they associate that with being a woman. So they think that they will be perceived as queer if they embrace their femininity. Uh, yeah, no, that is true. Um, especially, I mean, I, it, even me, I will occasionally have trouble with it just because I was raised as somebody who was male. My parents saw me as male, so I was raised as one. Um, so even sometimes with me leaning into a more feminine side can be kind of difficult for me. But um, I think slowly and slowly I'm sort of breaking down that barrier, uh, and I'm proud of that. But, um, yeah, I think um, embracing either a masculine and feminine side uh, can be kind of scary at first, I think, um, just because it can be scary for you internally, but also just how the world around you is going to perceive you. Um, that's a whole different level of... Uh, fear in that I rarely will embrace any sort of feminine um, traits outside yeah. <laughs> just because if people look at me and they see a man so it, it it can be kind of frightening so I I typically don't really do that but I'm trying to embrace more of my feminine side yeah and typically it's really important for people to ask pronouns nowadays yeah yeah because I think it's a good thing for people to do that definitely it's just yeah the world's changing, I think, for the better in that regard. It is changing quite a bit. And I've had professors ask pronouns at the beginning of the semester to make sure that they don't misgender anybody, which is really new. That didn't really start happening till after COVID, I yeah. noticed. The, I mean, it's weird because this semester, this is the first semester I've actually even had any classes that have asked that question. All of the art classes I'm taking this semester, every single one of my teachers asked that question. Uh, my history class didn't, but uh, <laughs> uh, my art classes, yeah, it, I was kind of shocked that that was even a thing. It kind of took me by surprise. Yeah, and they even asked a preferred name, which is kind of cool, because yeah. if you're someone that hasn't legally changed your name yet, then that's really important yeah. for someone to kind of see you for who yeah. you are and respect your pronouns and your preferred name. Absolutely. So gender being such a spectrum and non-binary being under the trans umbrella I've kind of learned over the years that some non-binary people choose to transition, but they still don't identify as female or male, the stereotypical version yeah. of each gender. And being on that spectrum, people assume that if they transition, oh, that person is transgender, mm -hmm. when in fact there is actually a term that is trans non-binary mm -hmm. for people that present as female and they choose to be on testosterone, get top yeah. surgery, even bottom surgery if they prefer. And I found that really intriguing because I didn't know that until more recently. Yeah, um, that I actually also didn't really know that until recently, but it's kind of on what we were talking about earlier. It's um, just how you choose to present yourself. Like um, some people identify as non-binary, but 
will present themselves more masculine or more feminine. But that doesn't mean, like you said, yeah, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily male or female. It's very interesting, but I also didn't know about that recently <laughs> until recently. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also very interested, kind of a switch of topic here. When you were growing up, what was your experience with your identity? And when was really the moment that you thought, I'm non-binary? Yeah, uh, fun stories. Um, <laughs> growing up definitely was weird because uh, I kind of grew up under the shadow of my brother. Um, like whenever I needed to do something, it was, oh, I should do this like how my brother did. Um, so that kind of created a lot of interesting like feelings in my head towards that of like, oh, a man should do this. Uh, boys should present like this or like, you know, only girls can do that. Like, um, I remember when I was a kid, we, all my siblings had Nintendo DSs. Um, <laughs> my brother got, oh, what did he get? Super Mario on the DS. And my two sister got this game called Nintendo Dogs, which is basically this game where virtually you take care of it. dogs and like cats, I think was like something you can do. <laughs> I wanted that game, but I was told, no, no, that's the girl's game. You can't play that game. But I was like... It looks fun to me. I, that's the one I want to play. Um, so just sense of small things like that. Um, uh, the moment I knew I was non-binary was definitely in high school. Um, it was my sophomore year, and I was on a high school field trip. Um, we went to Chicago, and um, the way it was situated was, like, um, the boys and the girls of the high school were um, put into, like, two separate rooms to stay in this hotel so obviously I stayed with all the boys and um, so forth. And I just remember thinking while I was in that room, just listening to everybody talking and hearing, looking at everybody interact. And some people would just get up and start taking off their shirts and walk around like it's no problem. And obviously I'm too uncomfortable to do anything like that. And I just remember thinking, something's not right here. <laughs> uh, and it was kind of after that, that the idea just started to pop in my head and um, my partner, uh, who also is non-binary, recently came out to me at that point that they were also non-binary. Um, so that's kind of where it started to get into my head of like, oh, maybe that's, maybe that's what I am. Maybe that's me. Uh, yeah. And, but I didn't uh, come to terms with it for like maybe five months after that <laughs> event. But that event is really what triggered the thinking process of who I am as a person. Yeah. And what's really important about everyone's queer experience is their timeline. Yeah. Everyone has a different timeline. And so when was, how long was the period between you kind of realizing that and when you had conversation with maybe your loved ones about what that meant to you? It, it was kind of hard. Uh, I kept it to myself for a long time. Um, just because mainly I was like, I had the fear of people, you know, would just kind of blow it off or, you know, not really listen to me. Uh, so I kept it to myself for a long time. But um, the first person I told was my partner. And I actually, uh, <laughs> I had a fear after telling them that they would think that I was copying them because they were also <laughs> non-binary. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, I can't tell them that that's what I am because they'll think I'm copying off of them. So after like maybe five or six months of just keeping it to myself and not telling anyone, we were just playing a video game one night and I was like, hey, so fun story. Uh, yeah, and I just told them and they were like, yeah, I kind of know. <laughs> and I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> um, I told my siblings, um, way later i probably told them two years after i told uh my partner um again same reaction they were just like yeah i kind of started to figure um i remember i tried to tell my mom but uh i think she forgot <laughs> so and i haven't brought up that conversation again so. <laughs> which is easy to forget for some people because if yeah. they're so used to knowing you for so long as one gender and certain pronouns it is hard for people to transition. Absolutely. I have people in my life that stumble and call me by my dead name. And 
oftentimes they think I'm going to be offended by it. But I'm like, you knew me as this person for 21 years of my life. And then when I chose to come out, it was more difficult for people to not so much call me a different name, but use different pronouns and kind of wrap their head around what it means for me to be trans. And so I think that's the struggle that people have whenever Mm -hmm. you do transition and you choose to come out and make that kind of your moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's definitely, it can be a struggle for people. Definitely. Um, It's easy for me though. I only ever knew you as Reese, so I have no issues with it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think sometimes being exposed just to touch on you saying that you feel like you would copy your partner of five years. Uh, Yeah. Five years. Yeah. Five years. And that feeling that we have as a queer community, I think if you're more exposed to people that identify and you say, I really resonate with you. I really resonate with how you feel about yourself and kind of reflect on that after the fact. Mm -hmm. I think that's the moment that I had personally when I kind of had that realization, those are my feelings. Yeah. Those are my feelings. I am trans and that was I came out a few months later yeah. during Pride Month this year after having a conversation with our close friend and roommate, Brad, because I was simply exposed to it. Mm-hmm. And I think when I was younger, I was exposed to queerness when I was very young. Yeah. I have an aunt who is one of my biggest inspirations in life and one of my best friends. And I was exposed to that when I was super young. Mm-hmm. And I that kind of affirmed to me that I was like, okay, this is okay. This is normal. Yeah. That's acceptable. And that's completely okay for me to realize that when I was super young. Yeah. And I didn't personally originally come out as lesbian until I was 14. Yeah. And my parents and family <laughs> kind of had the same reaction. They were like, we figured. We've kind of <laughs> known for a long time. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that exposure is really helpful to people that have those feelings. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think with this podcast, that is one of my goals. I would really love to expose people to this is normal. Yeah. Um, I think especially um, just letting people know that, you know, you're not alone. There are other people that feel the way you feel. Like there are people who have gone through the things that you've gone through. So like there's, especially I think, um, a big help is, I think the transition into college typically is a very big sort of helping hand into realizing who you are. Um, I think definitely for me anyway, the last like two years, the environment for me to embrace who I am has just felt, you know, so much safer, you know, being friends with uh, so many people who are also a part of the LGBTQ community. So I think it's just, um, finding your people and finding your community and um, sort of giving getting a helping hand on realizing who you are is such a big factor into it. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, just like I mentioned earlier, that everyone's timeline is different. Yeah. there's They could have known their gender or sexuality since they were like five. Yeah. And they could turn around when they're 22. I've even heard of stories of people not transitioning when they're trans until they're 50. Yeah, Because that's just their timeline, and that's the way that they chose to do it their own way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Everybody has their own unique journey into that. Um, Yeah, I've heard stories like that, too, and it's just, you know, it's honestly, it's inspiring just to hear people. It's never really too late to figure yourself out. Yeah, And I know it's hard for people to be out publicly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people choose to be really open on social media because all of those platforms encourage authenticity. And being authentic is one of the things that I personally embrace. That's just one of my values in life. And I think that our community really owns up to that and encourages people to be their true authentic selves because that's the most important thing to do, even if... It puts you at risk because hate crimes are climbing, especially after COVID. And I think that it's just really important for people to 
create an inclusive environment absolutely. to make our community feel comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. No one should no one should have to feel out of place and unsafe. And straight is not the default. Yes. <laughs> That's really important to note right now. Yeah. And um, I hear that straight, so often. Yeah. Is that people will just be like, oh, that, that's like the normal one. And then everything else is sort of like a weird mutation. No, it's not. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> and I think what straight people misunderstand from my perspective is that they assume that that's the default. Yeah. And my rebuttal to that is you don't have to come out as straight. And that's what makes our community so different right. yeah. and what makes us so marginalized and misunderstood. Yeah, I, I think honestly a huge factor for it, um, like at least from like the people that I've had conversations with who are straight, um, is that they kind of view any sort of like umbrella term under the LGBTQ community is sort of like you're born straight. Like that's just the default, you were born straight. And then you just kind of decide once you reach a certain age that, oh, this is what I am. Like, it's like it's a choice, which obviously it's not. Um, but, like, it's interesting, too, because it's not like they, when I've had conversation with them, it's not like they mean sort of, like, any, like, hateful messages toward that. It's just, like, that's the way that they were raised, and that's, like, how they were taught to view it and yeah it's that's not a good thing <laughs> unfortunately there's underlying homophobia transphobia yeah. and on very unfortunately microaggressions that yeah. people have learned over time especially towards our community because yeah. people are fearful of what they don't understand absolutely and that is understandable but i feel like our generation especially is like we have to bring attention to this yes because yeah. awareness and inclusivity that is not going to happen unless people make the effort. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not just something that's going to happen if we just leave it alone. We have to make an effort and take a stand. <laughs> exactly. So it's, I think that a really important question to ask you is that have you faced any underlying maybe microaggressions or transphobia over time from the time that you've been out publicly up until now well actually to be honest I'm gonna say I think I have it easier than a lot of people who are um, like transgender non-binary like com like I think compared to other like non-binary people I have it sort of easier just because and I think that's just because I present as more of a male because um, I have only really ever encountered like hate crimes and homophobia like a few times um one was my uh first semester on campus with my first roommate which was a very wild story <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting because it's important to note that sometimes that internal transphobia mm -hmm. comes from people within our own community yeah and i know that was your situation yeah <laughs> the person who I was living with was I signed up to be on the pride floor at here at EKU and yeah. the person turned out to be transphobic towards me and like was like I'm not comfortable rooming with someone like you and it just came as such a shock because I was like aren't you yourself like on the spectrum? Exactly and I think that's important to note within our community because I think everyone has different beliefs yeah right and everyone has different morals in life. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, people are fearful of what they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so if they look in the mirror and they can't even understand themselves, who's to say that they're- anybody else? Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it makes for a great story. <laughs> yes, which was a wild ride for you. But I think something that I've observed is that on this campus, especially, and in the surrounding areas, I grew up in Lexington. I went to a primarily privileged school where a majority of people were Christian. Mm -hmm. And I've just noticed a trend over time that their love is conditional for our community. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's interesting when we talk about that sort of thing because I 
I feel like I've noticed the same sort of thing because, like, um, the high school that I went to wasn't Christian, but a lot of people who in who were in it were Christian. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because I've heard them say before that, you know, like, you're loved no matter what, but then uh, oftentimes you will hear that statement, but then if somebody will come out as transgender, non-binary, what have you, that love is taken away. It's no longer there, and I think it's just... It makes me a little sad, <laughs> just yeah. because it, it feels like almost a betrayal. It's understanding. I mean, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and rarely did I ever encounter somebody that did not accept the way that I openly loved. Mm -hmm. And it was only in high school yeah. when people started using that beautiful phrase of love the sinner, hate the sin. Yeah. And little did they know that was a microaggression towards our whole community. Yeah. Nonetheless, me personally, because who's to say that I don't want to practice religion of my own? Mm -hmm. And that's my own business. Yeah. I don't absolutely. I don't openly choose to go to church because yeah. I think that I have a little bit of religious trauma that mm -hmm. has not been healed yet. And yeah. maybe that will take a while before I'm ever ready to yeah. step foot in a church again. And a majority of that is, I think, I'm going to use this phrase. I think that some Christians use that phrase to defend themselves because that's truly what they believe. Yeah. They believe the Bible as it's written, mm -hmm. and it is outdated. I think that sometimes it is misinterpreted and used almost as a hate crime against yeah. our community. And as I said earlier, I feel like some of the Christian community only has conditional love for our community. And I don't think they realize that a majority of us that feel so strongly against them or have a misunderstanding, because I think both sides have a misunderstanding, mm -hmm. and I think that we all just want to be equal yes. <laughs> and understood. And At the end of I the think, day, I think we all just want to be seen. Exactly. And I think they want to be seen for what they believe in. Yeah. And I think the misconception here, if I'm being honest, is the fact that there's a misunderstanding because that's something they believe in. Mm -hmm. This is who we are. This is our identity. Mm -hmm. This is what we're living with for the rest of our lives. I have to take testosterone my whole life mm -hmm. in order to consider myself a quote unquote real man. And that is a lifetime commitment. Right. That is not something I believe in. That's something I know about myself. Yeah. And then I have so many Christian friends in my life that are understanding, loving, yeah, yeah. and they try and encourage me to go to church. And, and I respectfully say, I love that offer, but I'm not able to because, unfortunately, I do understand that there are those people that will judge me yeah. or they will say a little comment of microaggression, and I will not be able to handle it mentally or emotionally because I am still in that place where that religious trauma holds me down. Yeah. And unfortunately, it has been recent that I have heard comments from some Christians. And I want to point out that I'm saying some Christians. I am not coming for a whole yeah. community <laughs> because um, it's not the whole community. No, definitely And not. I want to say that some of our community I've noticed have, they're very passionate about, I would say, their religious trauma and being against the church. And me, I'm a believer of equality mm -hmm. and spreading love no matter what. And I'm just in search for an understanding conversation. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. Because everyone has their own perspective. But that's just really important to me for everyone to know yeah. that I see them as equals. I will never treat someone as less than. Yeah. I think, especially in recent years, um, I just think there's been a great a huge divide between people in communities all around the world just because people seem to be having trouble just, like, understanding, I think. Like, for example, me personally, I, um, I am an atheist, but that does not mean, like, I absolutely 100% believe in freedom of religion. Like, you know, I absolutely know people who are religious and, 
you know, I was good friends with them all my life. And I definitely understand and respect that value and belief. And I don't, I, I, I feel like communities recently are just having a hard time reaching that milestone. Whereas you can either believe my way or no way, where it's just such a exactly. divide. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and we're all just looking for understanding and equality, and I feel like our respect, my personal respect for freedom of speech, freedom mm -hmm. of religion, right. the First Amendment in general, I strongly believe in that. Yeah, I also strongly right. believe in human rights. Yeah. I feel like if those are threatened, then certain people should not counter that with this is what I believe in. Yes, Human yeah. rights are not compromisable. I don't believe <laughs> yeah. that we can compromise between no, your belief and my yeah. human rights as human and rights your human given. rights. <laughs> exactly. Those are absolutely a given. Like, no matter what you believe, human rights are there. <laughs> and it's important to note that we are just two weeks away from some of the most important elections that we are facing since the presidential election mm -hmm. of 2020. And... I want to say that if people truly believe in equality and they love us for who we are, if you vote for someone that is actively against us, you are you are encouraging that hatred yeah. and that inequality that is just feeding into this stereotype. Yeah. And I think that that's important to note. So I just want to make sure that everyone's voting the way that they want to vote, yeah, but absolutely. respect human rights and just be a decent person. And, yeah. you know, that's just my personal opinion. But I kind of want to move on and talk about the non-binary community specifically because we've been talking right. a little bit about the whole spectrum. Um, everyone has their misconceptions. Mm -hmm. What is something you wish people knew about the non-binary community that they always get wrong? Instantly, right off the bat, is that not being non-binary is just like, oh, I don't really feel like presenting as one gender. Like, I've had conversations with people where they think non-binary is like, oh, so you just don't want to be either gender? And it's not that I don't want to be. It's just that this is just who I am. I cannot help it. Um, just any like anything else on the LGBTQ community. But... That is definitely, I've had multiple conversations where people will be like, well, why don't you want to be male? And I have to say time and time again, I'm like, okay, listen, um, it's not that I don't, it's not that I just randomly chose out of the blue that like, oh, you know what? I think I want to just not be, <laughs> I, I think I just want to not have a gender anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's just my whole life, I never felt right when I was told like oh what a nice looking young man from my grandparents <laughs> or like anything like that and it's yeah. just it never felt right um and it took a long time to realize what that was but that is definitely the big misconception that I wish people would change is that being non-binary is just the choice to not it's just the choice to forget everything like just the choice to not be something when it's not a choice <laughs> Exactly. And just you pointed out there that it's just a spectrum. There's different levels of being yeah. non-binary. And that's just important for people to know when they're trying to yeah. understand. Because yeah. that's all anyone's ever looking for is just an understanding. Yeah. I, I've met a couple people here who are non-binary but lean more towards like feminine presenting or lean more towards um, masculine presenting and are okay with actually using pronouns other than they, them. Like I know a... Um, they he uh, in one of my classes but me personally i'm a they them but um yeah it's just there's all different kind of levels to it it's really interesting yeah so something i'm going to ask all my guests on the podcast is how do you think we can build an atmosphere of inclusion on campus i might take a second here to think about that no you're okay i actually think one way that we could build on that is going back to something we were talking about earlier at the beginning is teachers actually asking students in a classroom 
um, if everybody, if they're open to it, of course, because not everybody has to feel the obligation to share, but um, asking, you know, what are your pronouns? What's your respected name? You know, making sure you get all that right. Because I've had experiences here where, uh, for context and reference, I also have uh, many learning disabilities. Uh, I'm dyslexic. I have dyscalculia. Uh, I have ADHD. I have a lot of learning disabilities. Um, and this is just for an example, but I've had multiple classes where, and particularly in the science department, where the teachers will basically tell me, oh, those aren't real. <laughs> and uh, learning disabilities are basically just students who are actually lazy, which is, you know, that hurt <laughs> hearing definitely. Um, and again, uh, I've had a class before where a teacher basically was like, um, listen, if anybody does want to, um, to email me and tell me that they have specific pronouns or like anything like that, do it on private because do it privately because I don't feel like um, addressing that here in class, which just felt very rude. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think a way that we could build a stronger community is if classes just were and teachers were more open to talking to students about this sort of thing and not having them, you know, just sit back in the classroom silently and just kind of listen. Um, yeah. And I think through that slowly, I think, I would hope students would just become more comfortable on campus itself if there's more comfortable, if there's more reason to be comfortable in the actual classes. Um, yeah. So that's what I would say personally. I feel like professors open that door. Yeah. As you said, they're opening that door to understanding and respecting someone's preferred name and pronouns. And that's really important to note. These are adults that are teaching young adults almost yeah. that are turning into adults and learning. And in that educational process that we are in the middle of before going into the quote unquote real world, mm -hmm. it's important to learn what that real world is going to look yeah. like. And inclusion is a part of that. Yes, absolutely it is. So I love to hear that professors are being open about it. The privacy thing I think is a little touchy mm -hmm. because I love that they're respecting people and asking them to do it in private, but also if someone wants to do it in the middle of class, they should feel comfortable enough yeah. to do so. It should not be an environment where you feel like you'll be attacked if you decide to disclose any of that sort of information. Exactly, exactly. Well, I love your take on the inclusion. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I had such a good open conversation with you. I did too. I was very nervous, but I had a great time. <laughs> good, good. I'm so glad. Well, this has been Queerly Thinking for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Reese Wheatley. We'd like to thank you for supporting the Eastern Progress Media Network.